Uh, good afternoon, ladies, and good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, and what about a round of applause for those few men that are hanging in here? Yeah. Actually, Steffi, since ideas are, our, are us, uh, what about uh, DLD men? So I have the pleasure to moderate the next 45 minutes, a session titled Leading Brand Innovation Through Design and Communication in the Digital Age. New rules, new values. I'm very happy to introduce three women leaders who live those new rules. Actually, they are setting some of those new rules with their companies in order to differentiate themselves in the marketplace and by also embracing new values without throwing those ones away that have innovated modern life. So please welcome Kitty Lun to my very left. Chairman, actually, and CEO of Low China, servicing clients within a space or a place whose meteoric rise in its economy went actually hand in hand with digital communication. Kitty Lun. From Hamburg, please welcome Inga Nancik, senior consumer strategist of a 21st century research boutique whose mission and DNA is rooted in a refreshing period of change, actually, of the 18th century called Sturm und Drang. Inge Nanzig from Sturm und Drang in Hamburg. <laughs> and from New York, please welcome Karen Spiegel, Director of Communications at RGA, a company that is leading change in communication and building brands and value. Karen and her colleagues just left the Cannes Festival of Creativity with the most prestigious prize, the Titanium Grand Prix for Innovation and Change in Communication. Karen Spiegel. So Kitty's, Inga's, and Karen's companies help shaping strategies, products, and brands for clients like Unilever and China Mobile, P&G and Audi, IBM and Nike. So let's hear from Karen first. Karen, please. Good afternoon. I want to... I want to move forward and talk about reinvention. I know reinvention is a hard concept to talk about this late in the day, but I want to ask you to take a minute and just consider if you were to reinvent your company or your agency or your team, how would you do it? What would you keep? What would you discard? And most importantly, what would the underlying values be? And those are the questions we've asked ourselves at RGA continually over the 30 plus year cycle the company has been in business. So I'm gonna quickly go through a little bit of background so you have a little context and talk about a few case studies of work that we've done innovative work for some of our clients. Back, so a little bit about the background. We have close to 1,200 people. I started 10 years ago at RGA and there were 150 people. We had one office in New York. Now we're spread over nine offices globally and we'll be opening an office in Sydney, Australia later this year and probably adding additional offices. And it just shows how quickly digital has been adopted and how um, supportive clients are in this area. We have a host of clients, as Michael said, that are uh, spanned both international, like Unilever, regional, and local clients. And we're in a unique position because we've worked across a, a bunch of different industries from TV to feature films to interactive and one of the few agencies today, maybe the only one that's been able to do that. 
But what I really wanted to talk to about is RGA's innovation cycle that has been approximately over a nine-year period. And you might ask, why nine years? And we've considered that, and for the most the reason is that technology changes approximately every nine or ten years. And as a result, there's a reason to innovate the company. The first nine-year cycle was, 19, it started in 1977 with the idea behind the Bauhaus and the importance of collaboration and bringing together of disparate parts such as creative and technology. The next nine years, we moved into a digital studio and did uh, broadcast TV work, adding around 4,000 TV commercials. Then we moved into the most difficult transition of all, and that was moving from a, essentially a production company into an interactive agency. It was incredibly difficult because it was closing down one company, starting something completely new. And some people came along, some people didn't. It was a very difficult transition. The internet came to the forefront and there was the whole promise of the web. We also won Nike in 2001, which continues to be a client today. And that set the benchmark for a lot of the wins Michael mentioned. Then we are moved into an interactive, a new agency model, and the real focus for this transition was creating projects and engagements that were really useful for clients, not just creating a, a message that went out to clients, but finding a new way to engage with customers that was really meaningful for the customer. And we're in the middle of are about to begin, but in the process of transforming yet again. And we've changed considerably. We're reinventing the agency internally. We're focusing on what we're showing here is something we've done for Nike, which is created an ecosystem, essentially a value, where we create different products and services, one adding to the next, each increasing the customer usefulness and value. And something that Apple has done for a long time with the iPod, iTunes, et cetera. Each new product or service adds more value. And so that's some of the things we're looking to do with our clients and helping them drive innovation. So I, I wanted to show a few quick case studies here. The first one is a company called Tim. It's one of the largest telecommunication companies in Brazil. And we worked with them to help them work more closely with their customers in social media. I'm going to show the video. Do you have sound? So when Tim, one of the largest mobile carriers in Brazil, wanted to tap into the youth market, they had to try something different. Tim Beta was born, a prepaid phone plan co-created by teens through social networks. It's an evolving social platform that allows teens to collectively design their phone plan by inviting select friends to join, vote on plan options, and even become the face of the advertising. We started by giving out a limited number of SIM cards by invitation only. Each teen had two invites to give to their closest friends. The Tim Beta app measured each member's social activity across Facebook, Orkut, and Twitter and recommended friends to invite based on who interacts with them the most. A first for Tim, kids voted for which feature would get a discounted rate, talk, text, or data. Nine of the most influential members were invited to participate in the advertising campaign. Their personal shots were shown all over the web under the mantra, I am beta. We also partnered with a TV channel to create Beta Live, a concert where beta teens voted for their favorite band to perform for 50 lucky fans broadcast live. In just a few hours, we received over 20,000 tweets, propelling hashtag Tim Beta as the most trending topic in Brazil. In three months, Tim saw a 50% increase in revenue and a 15% increase in plan usage. Over 650,000 people visited the site and requested invitations. In fact, demand for the invitations are so high, Tim Beta SIM cards are currently selling on auction sites for 
And just like today's teens, Tim Beta keeps evolving. Through trial and responsive design, Tim not only connected with its new audience, but established a new model to launch a service. In true beta spirit. So this was a way, as I mentioned, that we worked with the client to come up with an innovative solution for um, essentially coming up with a new way to promote their phone plans with their customers. The, the next case study, relatively short, I want to show is something we did with Google, and it was helping to promote their mobile wallet and created an integrated approach to uh, promoting it. This year, the wallet became more than a wallet, and the way we pay changed forever. Google Wallet came from the idea that shoppers needed access to more information. Google Wallet platform combines credit cards, loyalty cards, and offers into one place so you always have them with you. To develop this new payment platform, Google asked us to help design, brand, and create the user experience around the wallet. First, we named it. From there, we developed the wallet identity that showed how the product behaves. We also branded other wallet-related products, creating a suite of brands for the Google Commerce platform. To launch Google Wallet to the world, we created not just a normal press event, but an interactive experience that demonstrates a product. To build buzz, we took a classic Seinfeld clip and gave it a googly twist. And to promote trial in the real world, we created the first ever tapping spree at the American Eagle flagship store in Times Square. What's really exciting about this is it's just the beginning. So in summary, you've seen a couple of case studies here, but really it was really about reinvention and innovation and coming up with something that would actually work with our clients, combining not only the creative that we had in-house, but also the technology and having them collaborate and work together. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, one, one question before we move on. I mean, now 1,200 people. This seems to be already a tanker. How can you be so flexible when you always adapt to the new market situation and be fit and ahead? Because when you, when you look back, I mean, coming from an imaging company today into a powerful uh, communication company, but always technology is, is sort of the red thread through it. Well, I, w I would say, first of all, as I mentioned, collaboration is a key legacy to RGA, and it's, it's, it continues to be important, especially between the creative and the technology. And it's something that we've actually tried to encourage with our clients on the technology and the marketing teams, because many of them don't talk or don't even talk the same language and coming up with some thought leadership around that. And so that's one thing we've tried to do. And frankly, the reinvention is not easy. Some people just don't want to stick with it and they leave because it's, it's not an easy transition. Change isn't easy. But every 10 years or so, if you don't change, we find there's complacency and just just a need for real innovation, encouraging entrepreneurship at the company. Thanks, Karen. We will come back to your presentation. Yeah? Inga, please. OK. Ah, there it is. <laughs> um, nice to be here. My name is Inga Nancik, and I'm from the agency Sturm und Drang. Um, as you see from my um, symbol here, New Leaf, we are really a quite small leaf compared to um, which kind of agency Kitty and um, Karen are representing here, so I'm very proud to be on the same stage with those real leaders. Um, we are uh, having at least a quite um, decent building in, um, where do I have to put it to make it work? <laughs> Ah, there it is. So um, at least we have a quite proper building in, in Hamburg, but uh, to be um, honest, we are only on the top row of this building. It's a very um, old one. Um, and um, this is our main loca location, and um, we call ourselves um, an agency boutique because we are quite small. We are only 20 people, not 
2,200, uh, um, and we are, um, see ourselves more as a special task force. Um, what we do is research and strategy, innovation strategy, um, and we ourselves do not really design, so we are not really a digital agency or an interactive agency, but we feel we are a strategic agency for the digital age, so it's perhaps a bit different. Um, so what we do is that our research, our strategy is based on very consumer-centric focus and is very trend-based and that we use to um, enable innovation work um, within our um, clients' companies. So our mission is strategies for cultural innovation and that is perhaps the, the biggest point that I want to make um, tonight, that, that we see everything um, within the focus of culture. Um, and this is where also our name comes from, Sturm und Drang, Michael already mentioned it, it's referring to a literary epoch um, and it stands for soulful science and enlightenment beyond pure rationalism. Um, so um, we want to be a bit different than classical market research and like um, to, to say it a bit in evil way, number crunches or whatever. Um, but we um, want to work really close on the real lives and the real dynamics of what happens out there. Not only see it as consumption, but just life that's going on and how we can draw companies closer to this um, with methods, with thinking, with structures. And so our basis is always to work very emotional, also with a rational and cultural behavior, and um, to approach those things in very intuitive um, ways. And so this is also why within our agency, we are quite interdisciplinary. We almost have nobody from pure economics, but we are architects kind of coming from sociology, a um, lot of psychologists. Um, me, myself, I studied applied cultural sciences, cultural studies, so that's, um, that's our focus. Um, and why do we think that is a good strategy for an agency? Um, just a, sh a short background, it's not a very academic chart, it's just, uh, shall show you something. It is about the changes in society and economy that um, we can detect if we look at the past decades. And those changes happened on society level, technology level, of course, those change factors like um, globalization, digitalization, what we are talking exactly about when we talk about the digital age, but also what were the consequences then on a social level, individualization, um, convergence, new um, structures in work life, etc. And what here is interesting for us that we think that this really caused a shift um, uh, in the markets in terms of the paradigm that is defining where value creation happens. And um, this is very wordy, I just go the, um, slowly and uh, shortly into it. So the first level in a way um, is the level of having. So everything is about possession. So here markets are about um, products, trading objects, and what um, if you do advertising, if you do strategy, etc., or development, innovation, you focus on functional um, stuff, on features, this classical bigger, better, faster, more thing. In innovation, that leads to red race, and, and uh, nowadays we know that you can have a Me Too in a second, um, perhaps in the emerging markets, etc. So that's not really working anymore for differentiation. And also, the power shifted away from there. There, in that, that paradigm, manufacturers have all the the power because they could differentiate themselves just by having the right access to ingredients, to locations, to infrastructures, whatever. And then there is the next level, the level of being. So here um, it is all more about lifestyle and well-being, about treating people, the service, service industry in a way. Um, here people pay for gaining sense, meaning in a way, uh, or image and sensation, experience, and it's all about convenience, so that's actually trading the factor of time, uh, if it's convenient food or some kind of um, outsourcing of inconvenient um, things to, to services. So here it is what strategy, advertising, whatever, was all about inventing big brands, come up with, a, with an image that people want to um, attach themselves to, so big billboards on Times Square um, and uh, realms of experiences, flagship stores, etc. So everything that enables personal comfort and has an attitude of symbolic significance. And now the next level is 
that all moves more and more um, to the customer. We, uh, pe some people call it the age of the customer. We just um, want to talk about the paradigm of become because it tells us more about what does it mean then for agencies, companies and, and for, for customers. Because here it is all more dem democratized and it's about self-actualization. What you really want to produce is not an object or a brand, but you want to produce in a way yourself, the customer is the product. Because uh, you deal with personal effects, with transformation, and um, what Karen just presented and what she stands for with her clients is exactly that, what Nike did when the cooperation with Apple and all, iPod and all the stuff. And so here it is about brand stories that really have to talk about visions um, and relationships. It's much harder to really build a relationship um, with customers that is meaningful and unique um, instead of just come up with a new product with an additional feature. So we think we have to react to that. It's about creating relationships with an impact. And um, so the principles here are now cultural interaction and participation. And brands have to build cultural and creative equity. And so we think we have to help them. And to do so, you have to look more at the context. There's this nice quote, um, the way forward is paradoxically not to look ahead, but to look around. So if you want to innovate, you have to look around, get some kind of cultural understanding and understand the context of people. So that is why we think that you have to be very agile um, very reactive and um, have really a real understanding for cultural things. So this is why we try to really embrace this consumer-centric, collaborative and design thinking. And we have three strategies developed for us. I really have to make it short now. And this is that our research and whole market research inside uh, collection is um, reacting to this paradigm and we think we could talk it, uh, tell it like um, it's from hunting to farming. You just not hunt for insight, you just not um, dive into consumer's life on a short project-based level, but you have to be there constantly. You have to share a culture with them. You have to um, cultivate real connections and stay in touch to really understand. And we have uh, uh, reacted on that with um, defining a new role, uh, our new role as a community agent, to really work more um, with, com um, with communities that we um, really built for our clients, that we built for ourselves, um, to work constantly with people all across the globe. We are not uh, dependent anymore on some focus group in one city in one evening, but we can stay in touch all the time. Same is for trend research, for foresight. It's not just tracking developments to see are we on the right track, is the direction right, just affirming what many people still want, uh, give us numbers. It's about guiding, really opening up the space, um, create strategic corridors, create scenarios, and really help as a change agent companies to find their future territory. Um, and there was this nice quote from Abraham Lincoln, you cannot predict the future the best way to predict this is just created. So we try to be um, more like change agents, implement um, platforms within companies to um, get the get a continuous strategic and creative discourse running across silos, across departments, not just think in your um, departments, but, but also discuss across those um, established structures. And the last thing is from seller to storyteller. Everybody talks about storytelling, about transmedia storytelling, and that's hard work for those um, great agencies like um, those both women here represent, but also in companies, we think we have to um, educate them to be able to brief and to collect and uh, to choose such companies because most brand models still are rigid pyramids with three adjectives and they should create a unique vision and that's not really possible. So um, we try to embrace more um, cultural codes research, we act more with narrative um, methods as cultural agents, do more like brand scripts like in a theater, like in film to really um, be story starters and to make people to understand their own culture, the company's culture, because often they just react to a briefing from a higher hierarchy level and not really know exactly where they should head with their innovation and with their products. And so that is what we try um, to uh, enable and be a bit like a fire starter here. <sighs> Inga, thank you. Uh, 
Before we move on with Kitty, I mean, I'd like to pick one major thought that, that I take out of your presentation. And I believe the, the most important act, if we want to build a company, an enterprise, a brand, a product, a person, is to define a distinct culture, to build it on the culture. I believe culture has to be our first strategy before we do things. Uh, if you think about Burda, if you think about uh, uh, this place, DL, uh, DLD, community building. It's a, a one-word thing, and it just nails it. And I think that is really inbuilt in your personality, Dr. Burda, in, in, in Steffi's, and so forth. In RGA, it's Bauhaus. I mean, the main building... Uh, where um, uh, Bob Greenberg and where Karen lives, that is built from Walter Gropius. Uh, so, and that sort of sets the tone for everything. You've seen that in the design of Google. You've seen that in the Tim strategy and so forth. So I would like to discuss this kind of uh, uh, very uh, surprising idea to name your company Sturm und Drang and go back 250 years where actually a similar thing happened than today. At the time, the poets, they pushed humankind against the obrigkeit, against the rules and, and, and against the conventions um, through technology, printing uh, at the time. Today, it is digital communication. So. Uh, is, is that the reason why we've chosen that, and how does it uh, play out? Um, so I did not come up with it. Obviously, it was uh, were the both founders um, of our company, um, but it is fitting. The, this this shoe fits better and better. Um, when we came up, the, the agency was founded in 2002. We were still very exotic, and everybody was stumbling across the name, stumbling across the lack of a category. So what are you? Are you a strategic consultancy? Are you a qualitative marketing? What are you? And so, um, yeah, it, it was good to have um, always this ideologic um, vision that it's about that we are more poets and thinkers and not business advisors, that we... Um, that we wanted to go against those things that everything has to be proved in numbers. Market research was always just used to, to prove something that anybody was already accepting. And so to say, no, open up your minds. And Sturm und Drang was all about after the age of the enlightenment and pure rationalism. It was not going just for emotion and passion, but it was... Um, embracing holistic thinking and the holistic approach of humankind that always has to embrace reflection, emotion, and um, a zest for change and action. And um, this Tatendrang is also something that um, that is now yeah, very good fitting with all this agile, agile practices. Yeah. Thanks, Inga. Now let's hear from Kitty. Thank you, Michael. Please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or may I say good evening, because in my part of the world, this is like past 10 o'clock. Uh, so, you know, if I fall asleep, because it's because of my jet lag. I've got so much to tell you. Um, coming from uh, that part of the world, uh, you know, probably there are a lot of things that you don't know. Before I came here, when I heard about DLD women, I thought, you know, wow, great, you know, I want to tell you about the women in China. And I selected this topic, Superwoman and the Leftover Girl. So I'll explain, you know, what these women are. Uh, throughout today, I heard a lot of discussions and um, actually there may be a lot more commonalities between women here and your sisters over there. Um, the male-female balance is changing. In the past, in China, men dominate. Now, women are getting smarter and more educated. So they are making more and more money, and they are actually becoming more and more successful. Women are actually driving a lot of things. First of all, the luxury goods sales. China is the big, biggest market for Ferrari and Porsche and Louis Vuitton and Gucci and so on and so forth. These women are making a lot of um, purchase decisions. And... Um, 
even you know family decisions like cars and homes, you know, um, these super women are making those decisions. So why are they called super women? Well, actually, I think probably a lot of you can relate to that, and there are a lot of super women in China multitasking. Everybody has 24 hours a day, but they have to do a lot more. Um, so gadgets are helping them, technology are helping them, and they are getting actually, you know, very, very savvy in terms of being, becoming a superwoman. Um, the balance between men and women. Um, everybody heard about the single child policy, so, you know, not a lot of girls were born. Problem is that these girls don't have an eye on the boys because the girls are smarter. The, the girls' standards are higher, so they're not getting married. And um, it actually starts as early as late 20s that these girls get a lot of pressure from their family, from society that, you know, hey, hurry up, get married, because otherwise you will become a leftover girl. Leftover girl is uh, an, an internet language that um, these people are like leftover. You know, nobody wants them. But actually, leftover girls in China have another level of meaning. It's like, you know, more successful and the smarter women. And there, there are even like several very popular TV shows that are helping these leftover girls to find a boy, matchmaking uh, programs. So these women are ever evolving. They enjoy good social and economic status. They, they are very conscious about fashion and beauty and brand. And they, they grew up as little empresses being the single child of the family, so they're actually quite spoiled. They are self-indulgent. They can spend one month's salary on one bag. Um, they, are, they shop, they shop and shop and shop. They shop everything, they shop everywhere, um, they shop online. So, 80% of all decisions are actually you know, made by these women. So, how can companies innovate to capture them? Um, this is just a, a few snapshots of a recent um, workshop that we did about you know, understanding the nuances and the pressure of the women. And then we come up with stories and we talk about them. This is like even before we come up with the product concepts together with our clients and how are we going to solve the problems for our women. So at low, um, our positioning or our philosophy is populist creativity, which is to identify the right problem to and, and then come up with the right solution. We call it problem bias thinking. And then we look for insights, we dig deep, and we try to find out from popular culture that, you know, actually, you know, what insights can we draw from that. And then we change behavior on and offline. Uh, I'm going to show you a film before I talk about it. This is a film about um, e-commerce, it's about shopping online. Can we have the film? Well, that's a commercial for e-commerce. Um, it's a B2C e-commerce site, Taobao Mall. Um, it is, you know, China's biggest um, e-commerce site, uh, B2C e-commerce site um, by the Alibaba Group. Um, in that campaign, we're trying to change behavior. In fact, you know, nowadays when you shop, you don't go out, you don't go to the malls, you just go online. And in that particular commercial also um, try to change people's perception between B, uh, C2C e-commerce and B2C e-commerce. It is no longer your flea market. It is a you know, legitimate shopping mall that you can go to and enjoy. So I'm just going to show you some um, data about you know, what's happening in China. Um, C2C and B2C e-commerce are big. Um, 
a lot of people are online. Women nowadays in China are very, very connected. Um, and actually, that commercial belongs to the Alibaba group. Alibaba was started by um, a very visionary man. His name is Jack Ma. This is his photograph. He started Alibaba.com, which is a B2B platform. And then that was like, um, I first started working with him about 15 years ago, 1999, 98 when he first got his funding. And then he subsequently went on to build his C2C e-commerce, B2C e-commerce, payment platform, and then the search uh, engines that they are doing. And um, I know he is building a cloud already. It's called Ali Cloud to take care of all the information and data that they have. So um, all these are under one group. So they are the, uh, China's biggest e-commerce. Alipay. Alipay is China's biggest, um, pay, uh, actually, sorry, um, the world's largest payment platform. They uh, overtook um, PayPal two, three years ago. In fact, Alipay's CEO is a woman also. Um, Yitao is trying to um, um, gain ground with um, QQ, uh, no, uh, Baidu. Uh, which is the biggest um, search site, so we'll see how it goes. But um, they've got like very, very strong leaders in every aspect. Um, if we look at the growth in the Chinese market um, over the past two years, I mean 2011 compared with 2010, you will know why you know, a, a lot of these things are happening. Um, Weibo, uh, Oh, I put up my Weibo account at the beginning. So if you are on Weibo and if you know Chinese, then you can follow me. I will follow you too. Um, so like things are happening so fast, so big and so tremendously. Um, mobile has, been, has always been a China's way of life and it will be even more so um, with the gro uh, growth of smartphone. In fact, last year was the first year that smartphone sales in China overtakes um, PC sales. So. China Mobile, the network, is a way of life. Tmall, which is our client also, um, is like, you know, shop on the go, shop anytime. Um, we also work on Alipay, which is the pay payment platform. Um, nowadays, mobile payment is really doing like a tremendous job. They have 30, 30 plus apps um, on their site that you can do any kinds of payments. Um, you can pay anytime for anything to anyone. If we go out to dinner, I can pay you my portion of my dinner through Alipay, and you can do it anywhere. You can do it at home. Um, I'm not going to do it. Um, Chinese women are fashion and uh, beauty conscious. They are also brand conscious. If we compare Chinese women and US women, Chinese women are so very brand conscious that if you put the monogram there, they will buy. Um, so just a very quick recap of uh, Lowe's philosophy, populist creativity, problem bias thinking, deep understanding of popular culture, and we try to change behavior on and offline. Time's up, I'm run. Thanks, Kitty. Uh, first question, who is creating the work in your industry, men or women? Both. Um, I think we, in, in Asia actually, we have quite a, quite a good balance between men and women. Um, Actually, we have a shortage of talent. So sometimes you don't care what gender they are. As long as you are good, then you, know, you get um, good advancement. We've got um, like four creative directors. Two of them are women. You're looking for a 68-year-old copywriter? <laughs> yeah, do you write Chinese? <laughs> OK, yeah, that's a problem. Now. Um, uh, th there is uh, an interesting concept uh, emerging, actually, and that is called reverse innovation, which means uh, the mature countries, they learn from these powerful rising economies what they are doing really special. Uh, what can we learn from China? I think the biggest word probably is leapfrog. Um, well, we never went through any stage of landline. There were so few landline. And uh, nowadays, I mean, people just uh, use the mobile phone. Um, China never had black and white television. <laughs> we have only color television. Um, 
like, you know, the way that we use the mobile phone, you know, having those bite-sized entertainment, soccer, you know, and all that, they, they happened a lot earlier than many Western countries, thanks to the lack of those for a long time. So people are very hungry for information and for all kinds of uh, uh, help and tools. But for the last 10 years, it was really very interesting to look into innovation in Asian communication. In the first place, the internet ability of the mobile phone came out of Japan, and therefore a lot of uh, technologies in, in, in the usage. Uh, Citizen-generated journalism out of South Korea. Uh, today we've seen uh, um, these uh, shopping yeah. via... Tesco. Um, Tesco. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, the, the QR code yeah. and so on. Anything else? Um, I think, uh, I'm, I don't really want to sell my client, but I think um, Jack Ma has really done a tremendous job. I mean, I remember somebody describing him as um, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and Jeff Bezos wrote into one because of the kind of things that he does. So I guess, you know, if you have a vision, then, you know, put it to work, it will happen. Um, his headquarters is in Hangzhou, and uh, there are already about, um, 20,000 employees working on it and I think um, you know uh, customer service is very important to him being honest and loyal is very important to him and I think all these things are you know making the, the uh, corporation so great thank you Kitty. Karen uh, looking at your ecosystem uh, it seems it describes a complete new way in looking at a brand which means uh, years ago, we've always created a campaign to distinct an equal product, like, um, let's go to the cigarettes, Marlboro, Marlboro Country. It could have been Winston Country, actually, if Winston would have chosen this campaign. But the products are pretty equal. Now, when you look at your ecosystem, it means that you are now focusing through technology in distinct, creating distinct products, and then building them around the consumer, it creates a new feel and a new heritage of a brand, a new culture of a brand. Yes, uh, one of the things we think about a lot is really what the consumer wants. You can create lots of products and services, but in the end, if the consumer isn't interested in it, no one's gonna use it or come back to it. And, and the ultimate goal is to have people come back and interact with the brand. I mean, Nike's been a terrific client for us over 10 years because um, as we've changed as an agency, they've actually incentivized us to change because they've changed their structures internally. And so it's been a really a push and a pull kind of a situation with them, but as well with other clients. But I think a lot of people don't spend enough time really thinking about what the content, what the content should actually be in the products and services because you can have creative people come up with different ideas or technologists build something, but ultimately, if it's not useful, then no one's going to use it. And you need to constantly go back and iterate and change over time. Thanks, Ken. It would be nice to hear from, from uh, all of you uh, the relationship you have with your clients. Um, I mean, we are living in a changing world. Who's driving change more, the clients? to the agencies or the agencies to the clients, or is there harmony? Uh, I mean, you work with China Mobile, a very explosive speed client, if, if you will. Yeah. Nike, just amazing what, what they've done uh, with, with their concepts. Or Audi, if you take Audi, uh, uh, if you look at an Audi today versus 20 years ago, yeah, I mean, this is amazing. Even a BMW has to watch it. Yeah, so. Why don't we start with you, Kitty? I think uh, it's actually quite an interesting um, way of working with our clients. Nowadays, things are happening so fast. I think I would use um, co-creation 
to describe um, our uh, relationship, especially we work very closely with Unilever because we work on 18 brands for them. And there are constant workshops because workshops are like everybody puts their heads together. And nowadays I'm seeing workshops being, you know, not just ourselves, but, you know, all kinds of agencies. They have, you know, word of mouth agencies, PR agencies. We all join together to come up with ideas. But one thing that is very unique nowadays is change. Things are happening so fast. I mean, a briefing today will change tomorrow. But, but it is a reality that we have. I mean, if we are not fast enough, we'll be left behind. Thanks, Kevin. Inga? Yeah, I think perhaps like in every relationship, there, is, um, high, there are highs and lows. And what you, you also said, it's this back and forth. Um, often it's very... Um, stressful um, and often you are more like in, in mentoring and nudging so often you're also in learning and um, I think we don't understand ourselves as a classical supplier who has to just um, yeah react on some kind of briefing because often you feel that they are not even sure what they want to brief or what they're heading at and then you have to be more proactive and active and um, and other points you have to sit and listen first because uh, you don't have to only be customer centric but also client centric in this direction to see that things are applicable because often you're just also in your research in your strategic consultancy work you're sometimes also just too quick or two years ahead and they just don't have the structure for it it's not um, a fault of, of some um, person but it's just that they are also sitting in a corset and they have to run through evolution by themselves as an agency also has to do and so you, you also have to be loyal in a way and 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 grow with each other and sometimes it means that you don't talk f uh, with each other for a few months or uh, weeks and then again it's um, you feel that now you you can really give each other something thanks Karen yeah, I would say one of the things we've taken our cue from has been the technology industry because RGA has such a legacy of having technology incorporated at the agency from the very beginning. Approximately 20% of the agency are actually engineers now. And one of the things they've done is a lot of rapid prototyping. So we're looking to do much more of that going forward, to just come up with something and then to iterate with that going forward. It's, it's difficult today because many of our clients need to actually change their structures internally. And so some of the barriers is, since so much of what we do is actually developing a product or a service has technology component, is really getting, as I mentioned before, their technology team and their marketing team together, which has been a roadblock for many years. Thanks. I have a lot of appetite, what I've heard from the three of you. I believe uh, that our main focus these days has to be to contribute to people's lives. Uh, in the past, those companies that have done it, they had the benefit and they were sustainable and they, they live in the long run. Uh, it is very important that we understand the people and use our ability to deliver to their lives that they, you know, can, can live in a better way. We contribute. And if we drive that, uh, I think we are well off. And that should be the first mission. And I think that came out of your presentation uh, in, in, in a wonderful way. I want to thank you. Uh, unfortunately, time is limited. I encourage everyone to dig into your websites and learn more. And you're definitely not uh, leftover girls. You're, you're wonderful leaders, and thanks for being here. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, I have... Um, uh, women in leadership, yeah, that, that links actually to uh, three more minutes. Uh, and uh, if I could have... Oh, okay. Use that one. Okay. Uh, I want to, to, um, to uh, communicate that it would be really great to have your engagement and your thinking behind that school. Uh, I will explain what the school does, but my wife Helga is sitting over there, and from time to time, we, 
Yeah? From time to time, we grab some money and uh, give a scholarship for the school that we've built and we love so much and it's not only a love because it really uh, has made the difference in many peoples of, of their lives. And actually RGA and, and Kitty, I mean great supporters of that school, please have a seat and I go over there. Yeah? So. Uh, I'd like to explain to you quickly what the school is doing. Um, we started uh, like six years ago uh, with 12 uh, uh, people and a thought. Our mission uh, was to become the world's leading institute for quality executive education and research into creative leadership in creative industries such as advertising, media, journalism, entertainment, communication technology, we've added that, design and marketing, paving the way for standards, for raising standards in communication. In short, uh, creative leadership for excellence in creative industries. That is our uh, core idea. And the mission is turning great creatives into great creative leaders. Why is that important? A great creative person has a huge portion of insecurity inbuilt. And when the person is asked to lead a company, sometimes there is not all the job description in place uh, that the person should have. So our feeling was we can help here in many ways. And actually the vision of, the, of our place is a creative CEO in every creative company. That is maybe a little bit overboard, but if you have a creative company and you don't have a creative leader on top of it, it's not a creative company. Yeah, you might do some business and pretty well in a category, but it's the, the creative heart is missing. And I think uh, of those of you that work in creative companies, they know what I'm talking about here. The output we wanted to go for was leading your enterprise into a competitive future, future and build uh, uh, expertises around it that you can own. Leading clients and partners, we talked a bit about it, leading the product quality, leading people, leading yourself, and leading the industry by learning to handle complexity better, by becoming better in analysis, better in strategies, better in decision making, better in alignment, and better in implementation. And our theory is if you are good in those dimensions, suddenly a leader falls into place, a person that can give a more thoughtful advice. We started out as advertising people, but we quickly expanded it into media, journalism, entertainment, design, communication technology, and marketing. It's an executive MBA. It's a global uh, uh, program. We have now participants from over 50 countries. The academic faculty and the creative faculty is sort of collapsed. So from an academic point of view, we can tackle a problem and have a guru uh, explaining what he or she has done in order to uh, solve a problem or take an opportunity. The whole uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, five double weeks happen to be in Berlin, in New York, in Los Angeles, in Tokyo, and in Shanghai, and thesis work is actually the, the whole thread. We have godfathers coming in, helping the classes like a guy like Keith Reinhardt, John Goat from the entertainment industry, Sir John Haggerty, Seema Stein, uh, a guy from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame who actually signed up uh, 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 about 30 bands, Piyush Pandai, Bill Rohde, uh, the former CEO of uh, MTV, of Nickelodeon, and uh, Comedy Central, and so forth. Uh, we have fantastic speakers coming in. Name dropping is always very good, but those are icons 
in uh, those various industries and we have support from the Board of Governors. One thing is really missing in that school and that is women. We have only 25%. We can say from those women that uh, uh, do this uh, executive MBA, about 25% emerged as CEOs of their companies. So it is working extremely well. And Helga's and my thought was to address the DLD women and please apply for the school and um, you know we all also will help uh, um, uh, with that scholarship so and spread the word about the school at one day we want to have 50 50 women and men and uh, we are sure it can be achieved and the lectures we had it is very healthy for a company to have that so please apply for that scholarship and uh, go and look it up at www.berlin-school.com. There you find the details. And once we've boiled it down to three people, it would be really nice if we could get Maria Burda Furtwängler to help us choose the person that should get the award. So, yeah, yeah. You, you do, you've done so well here. We would like to have you on the board. Huh? So, thank you very much, and uh, let's enjoy the evening. Thanks, Helga. Huh?